Sentiment and affect lexicons can be useful for a wide range of natural language processing tasks. In this video, I'll discuss the basics of how one might build a sentiment or affect lexicon. I'll touch upon crowdsourcing, annotation, schemata, adjudication, and finally close with a brief overview of semi-supervised affect induction. There are many ways that you can build a lexicon for use in your NLP applications. Two of the most common ways are by obtaining expert labels or by crowdsourcing your labels. Obtaining labels from expert annotators involves identifying individuals who you expect to be highly knowledgeable about your subject domain. For instance, if you're annotating a corpus of medical documents, you might recruit doctors as your expert annotators. You personally train those experts in your labeling scheme, and then they provide annotations for your set of documents. Labels acquired from expert annotators are typically highly reliable. Um, so if a doctor says that the contents in a span of text refer to some specific medical diagnoses, you can generally trust that they're correct. If you are having multiple expert annotators label the same document, you'll also generally find high agreement between their labels. However, obtaining labels from expert annotators can also be costly and time consuming. Experts generally do not volunteer to label data for free, and they'll likely have to balance their annotation duties with other tasks in their life, resulting in a longer delay until you receive your annotations. In contrast to obtaining your labels from expert annotators, you can crowdsource your labels instead. Crowdsourcing refers to the act of collecting labels from a large group of anonymous users, the crowd, so to speak, typically on the web. Crowdsourced annotators are not generally experts in your topic domain, so depending on your task, their labels might be much less reliable than labels provided by expert users. You generally only want to crowdsource labels for tasks that you feel confident that any person could reasonably perform. Using crowd workers will probably also result in lower agreement on your labels since you're not able to provide customized training to them and you're unlikely to have the same set of annotators labeling each instance. Despite these shortcomings, using crowd workers to create annotated datasets is extremely popular in natural language processing, primarily because it tends to be very inexpensive relative to recruiting experts, and it's also much quicker. An extremely popular resource for building crowdsourced datasets is Amazon Mechanical Turk. In Amazon Mechanical Turk, you can set up small, easily digestible tasks called HITS, which is short for Human Intelligence Tasks. You offer to pay a nominal fee for each short HIT, and then you make it publicly available. Amazon Mechanical Turk charges a small additional fee for each HIT, and in return, anonymous users from their large existing user base who match your criteria, accept one or more of your HITS, work on them, and then receive payment once you approve their work. Well-designed tasks with fair pay can easily result in thousands of annotations in the span of a day, making Amazon Mechanical Turk an excellent solution for people with straightforward tasks for which they need to collect a lot of annotations in a short amount of time. Another popular resource for crowdsourcing data in NLP tasks is Appen, which was formerly known as Figure 8, which was formerly known as Crowdflower. Um, this platform operates under a similar paradigm as Amazon Mechanical Turk. You create tasks and they become available for the large existing user base of crowd workers to complete. Finally, if you'd rather not use one of those sources, either for budget reasons or because you're trying to target a different user base, you can host your own annotation platform either as a survey or using some other mechanism and post links on the web so that anonymous users can complete your task. A lot of times in order for this to work, you have to somehow incentivize completion. Um, a common approach is to employ some sort of gamification strategy so that users feel like they're playing a game rather than supplying annotations. An important decision alongside your method for collecting annotations is with regards to what kinds of annotations you're actually looking for. An annotation schema defines the types of labels that are permissible for your data, as well as the criteria for selecting those labels. For example, if you're creating a sentiment data set, there are numerous ways you could label your data. 
You could ask annotators to provide categorical labels of positive, negative, and neutral. You could ask annotators to provide a score for each of those dimensions. Or you could ask them to provide a single score ranging from a minimum to a maximum at either discrete or continuous points. In each case, you could provide examples of positive, negative, and neutral text so that the annotators had an idea of what they were looking for in each category. After you collect your labels, it's unlikely that you'll have perfect agreement. Sooner or later, you'll run into a case where your annotators disagreed with one another. When that happens, you need to adjudicate the instance. That means that you need to have some impartial way of judging what the actual labels should be. There are many ways that you can adjudicate labels when building text corpora. If you have access to a trained annotator, you may opt to use a third-party adjudicator. A third-party adjudicator is an individual who did not originally contribute any annotations. Um, they look at the annotations that were received as well as the instance itself and make an informed decision about what the best label should be given the available information. If you use a third-party adjudicator, you should make sure that it's someone whose opinion you can trust. They should have close knowledge of the annotation task. In some cases, and assuming they weren't involved in contributing annotations already, the project leader may be a good choice for the third-party adjudicator. If you don't have access to a third-party adjudicator and you've collected three or more annotations, for instance, you can take the majority annotation as your gold standard label. If you do this, you'll want to have a plan in place for breaking ties. If you have an equal or greater number of classes than annotators, or if you have an even number of annotators, you could have cases where the majority is split equally between multiple classes. You might choose to break ties randomly or using some other heuristic decision-making process. Finally, if you've collected numeric labels for your data, you might choose to adjudicate instances by taking the average label. If you do this, you may want to have a backup plan in place for cases where there were significant disagreements between annotators so that you don't end up providing them with a misleading neutral gold standard label. One common approach for this is to average annotations if they are within some threshold distance of one another, but forward them along to a third-party adjudicator if they are not. Until now, we've assumed that we have access to some pool of annotators regardless of whether they're experts or crowd workers. However, this may not always be the case or you may simply not be interested in sourcing large quantities of labels from annotators. An alternative approach for learning labels for affect lexicons is to perform semi-supervised label induction. Semi-supervised label induction is where you start from a small set of seed words with their corresponding labels and gradually find ways to label other unlabeled words based on their similarity to those seed sets. There are two main families of seed-based semi-supervised lexicon induction algorithms. Um, generally categorized as axis-based and graph-based. Axis-based lexicon induction works by inducing where a new instance sits along the spectrum from positive to negative instances. It works quite simply. You start with a labeled seed set and you compute an embedding of some sort for each of those seed words. You then find the centroids of the positive and negative classes respectively. In a sentiment lexicon, these centroids would correspond to positive and negative sentiment. You just subtract the negative centroid from the positive centroid to find the axis, and then for a new unlabeled word, you just compute the similarity between that word's embedding and the axis. This can just be done using cosine similarity. You end up with a score, and higher scores mean that your new unlabeled word is more closely aligned with the positive sentiment class. Graph-based lexicon induction works by inducing how confidently a random walk from a known positive instance will end on a given word. This process is also quite simple. You start out by defining a connected graph where each word is connected to its k-nearest neighbors. The edges in the graph are weighted according to the similarity between words. 
You identify words from the labeled seed set, and for a given seed word, you perform a random walk on the graph with the likelihood of moving from one node to another being proportional to its edge weight. A word's polarity score for a given seed set is then the probability that a walk from a member of that set will end on it. In turn, a word's overall polarity score is based on both the scores for the positive and negative seed set, as shown here. Finally, you repeat this process multiple times with different seed sets using bootstrapping and assign confidences to word scores based on their standard deviations across these multiple runs. Although both the axis-based and graph-based methods here work well using cosine similarity as their similarity metric, historically researchers have taken several other interesting approaches for defining similarity as well, including using syntactic cues based on and or but conjunctions, checking for words with the same stem but with differing morphological negation, and checking synonymy and antonymy between word nets and sets.